premium audio course for August. I am so thrilled that you are part of this circle. My name is Heather Tesco, and you also know me from the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm so happy that you're here in my membership group in the Tutor Learning Circle, and I'm excited to dive deep into the subject of exploration. This month, it's summer, it's August. This is when we might normally be traveling. Of course, it's also 2020, so nobody's traveling right now. But I thought that in that spirit, we could talk about travel, specifically the travel of the explorers. So this course is going to be in three units. In the first unit, this one, we're going to talk about the lead up, the 15th century and the lead up to the age of exploration in England. And then we're going to talk about the Elizabethan golden age, Francis Drake, Walter Raleigh, all of that stuff in the second unit. And then in the third unit, we're going to go more into the 17th century and talk about what England was doing in North America and sort of tie all of the loose ends together. Okay, so that's what we're doing. In 1589, Richard Hakalite, a clergyman and geographer, published England's first travel guide. It was called Principal Navigations, Voyages and Discoveries of the English Nation, made by sea or overland to the most remote and farthest distant quarters of earth at any time within the compass of these 1500 years, divided into three several parts according to the positions of the regions whereunto they were directed. The first containing the personal travels of the English unto India, Syria, Arabia, the second comprehending the worthy discoveries of the English toward the north and northeast by sea, as of Lapland, the third and last including the English valiant attempts in searching almost all the corners of the vast and new world of America, whereunto was added the last most renowned English navigation around about the whole globe of the earth. That is one heck of a title. We'll call it Principal Navigations for short. Published in 1589, like I said, Principal Navigations is a record of the experiences, voyages, and adventures of a group of explorers whose names are known to anyone who has studied the age of exploration. But it isn't just a work that focuses on famous people. It also shares stories of lesser-known individuals whose work would be lost to us but for this book. And the thing is, when Hakalite published Principal Navigations, it was less than a hundred years after England's first voyage of discovery, when John Cabot became the first European since the Norse to explore the coastal parts of North America around 1496, when Henry VII started focusing on building up his navy and catching England up to the rest of Europe in terms of exploration and discovery. And that's what we're going to talk about in this first unit. Because places like Portugal had a hundred years on England. Henry the Navigator in Portugal initiated the Age of Discovery by sailing around Africa. He reached the Azores and the Sargasso Sea in the early 15th century. Spain had taken over the Canary Islands in 1402. Shipbuilding had changed. Ships were much lighter while also being larger, allowing for more supplies and longer voyages. Additionally, carrying more cargo could make long-distance trade missions possible and profitable. And of course, this was the number one economic factor of discovery. We all hear in school about the Crusades being the main reason for the Age of Discovery, and Crusaders found a liking for silk and spices, and boom, Columbus is sailing to India, right? Only thing is, there was a period of several hundred years in there for the technology to catch up, and there were early travelers who were paving the way for later explorers. So one major event was in 1291, the Muslim fleet guarding the Strait of Gibraltar was defeated by Genoa. In that year, there was one of the first attempts to explore the Atlantic Ocean. They were merchant brothers Vadino and Ugolino Vivaldi sailing from Genoa with two galleys, but they disappeared off of the coast of Morocco. And of course, that became very famous and it continued to feed these fears that people had of travel across the ocean. Then in the 14th century, from 1325 to 1354, there was a Moroccan scholar from Tangier. His name was Ibn Battuta. He journeyed through North Africa, the Sahara, West Africa, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, the Horn of Africa, 
the Middle East and Asia, and he made it to China. He returned and he dictated an account of his journeys to a scholar that he met in Granada, the Rila, which means the journey. And then between 1357 and 1371, there was another book of travels that took Europe by storm. It was a book of travels by John Manville, and it was very, very popular, though it was often unreliable and fantastical. Its accounts were used as a reference for Egypt and the Levant in general, as well as for the East. So there were travelers, individual travelers, who were going back and forth and who were publishing their stories. Of course, we hear about like Marco Polo and things like that. So there were other people. It wasn't just Marco Polo. But then in the 14th century, we have the Black Death, which would have pretty much stopped travel and trade as Europe tried to recover from that. And then the Ottoman Empire began to rise, which again further limited the possibilities that Europe had for overland trade. Now, interestingly, it wasn't just Europe that was driving the pace of trade and discovery. The Chinese also were trying to come west. So Europe was trying to head east. The Chinese were trying to come west to trade with Europe and to make it easier. Between 1405 and 1421, There was a series of long-range missions in the Indian Ocean that was sponsored by the third Ming emperor. They had a whole new fleet of ships that were prepared for these international diplomatic expeditions, and thousands and thousands of sailors were involved in it. The first one departed China in 1405, and there were at least seven journeys that were made. These Chinese fleets visited Arabia, East Africa, India, and Thailand, and they traded goods along the way, presenting gifts of gold and porcelain and silk and silver. And in return, they received ivory and camels and zebras and giraffes and all kinds of things like that. The emperor who had sponsored all of this died around 1431, and there was one final expedition that may have reached as far as Madagascar. So during the 15th century, we've got the Portuguese and the Spanish exploring along one coast of Africa, and then the Chinese coming along the other coast of Africa. And there was this whole kind of network that was springing around, this maritime network with cross-cultural relationships and exchanges that were beginning to build. We have people meeting each other and being able to talk to each other. It was really an exciting time to be involved in exploration and trade. The other one I haven't talked about is the Republic of Venice, which had been involved in maritime trade and exploration since the 8th century. And they actually held the monopoly of European trade with the Middle East. They held the monopoly on the silk trade and the spice trade and herbs and drugs, opium, all of this kind of stuff. And they were very, very rich. Venice was incredibly wealthy during this time. They also managed to tick off pretty much everybody because they were sort of like Switzerland. They tried to stay neutral in all of the arguments Between the Turks and Muslims and the Europeans, the Christians, Venice tried really hard to play right down the middle because they knew that they had these valuable relationships on both sides. So they wound up kind of making everybody mad, but they were still leading in terms of commerce and and sailing and discovery, all of that kind of stuff. So it was all right. So the way it worked with the Venice routes and the way they traded with the Muslims, the Muslim traders dominated the maritime routes throughout the Indian Ocean. They would go to India and then into the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, and then they would have overland routes through the Mediterranean coast. And that's where the Venetian merchants would pick them up or meet them and do the change. And then Venice would go into Europe. Then, of course, one major event that could possibly be responsible for launching much of the Renaissance, much of the Age of Discovery, much of the rediscovery of ancient texts was when the Byzantine Empire of Byzantium fell with the sack of Constantinople from the Ottoman Empire. So suddenly, the same land sea routes that Venice had been using and that the Europeans had been using were no longer available, and they needed to find other routes. Venice was having to move into the Black Sea to trade, and the Genoese, another Italian state, had turned to North Africa for wheat and olive oil and to search for silver and gold. 
So the way Europeans had traded before that point, they stayed really close to land. Even sailors who spent their life at sea might never actually lose sight of land, ever. They used charts and they used coastal landmarks. But then throughout the 14th century and the 15th century, there were advances in cartography. There was the use of the compass that came into wide use and astronomy. People were learning more how to navigate by the stars. And then also there were some Arab navigational tools like the astrolabe and the quadrant using the stars. And that began to become popular in Europe. So we have the need and the desire, and now we just need the technology to catch up. Enter Portugal. During the 14th century, the Portuguese were really taking an interest in exports and finding new areas to fish and trade. They also wanted more maritime commerce, and soon they actually discovered the Canary Islands. The Portuguese were the first ones to officially claim it, but then Castile disputed it. And we have one of the first kind of naval rivalries going on over a newly discovered land. In 1415, Queto, which is now Spanish, uh, an island close to Morocco in the Mediterranean, was conquered by the Portuguese. And there was a young prince called Henry the Navigator. He was there and he really wanted to learn more about North Africa. He wanted to find out where these links were. He wanted to know how far the Muslim territories extended. And he was actually also hoping to find the legendary Christian lands that supposedly were in the south of Africa, like the long-lost Christian kingdom of Prester John. He also wanted to see whether it was possible to reach the Indies by sea and get spices that way much easier. So he started sponsoring voyages down the coast of Africa. Nobody had ever been that far before, and there were all these myths about monsters and the edge of the world. But Prince Henry challenged these beliefs and started pushing his sailors further and further. Now, at the same time, Castile, the kingdom of Castile, also started to explore and try and find some of these new lands and new routes to the Indies. And by 1492, they were sponsoring voyages across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, interestingly, Columbus had actually presented his project to Portugal in 1485 and 1488, and both times Portugal rejected it. So it was Ferdinand and Isabella of Aragon and Castile that were able to actually fund Columbus in the end. And it was this unification of the two crowns of Castile and Aragon that really made it possible for Spain to start to take a leading role in exploration in the 15th century. Columbus, of course, left. Palos de la Frontera with three ships close to Sevilla. He left with these two ships that we learn about in school all of the time. And he sighted land on the 12th of October, 1492. Columbus returned back in 1493 and made his report to Ferdinand and Isabella. But news started spreading very quickly of these new, newly discovered sea routes. Of course, he still thought he had made it all the way to India. So people were very, very excited to learn about this new route to India. The Spanish and the Portuguese were arguing over who was going to control this newly discovered route, these newly discovered lands, and the Treaty of Tordesillas divided the world between Spain and Portugal. In the treaty, the Portuguese received everything outside of Europe east of a line that ran 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands, which were already Portuguese, and the islands discovered by Christopher Columbus on his first voyage. And then the Spanish received everything to the west of this line. And that's why, of course, in Brazil, they speak Portuguese as opposed to Spanish in the rest of Latin and South America. And by the early 16th century, there are many, many explorers, voyages of exploration leaving from the port in Sevilla. So the Spanish and the Portuguese are really in a race to try and figure out what these new lands are that were discovered and if they lead to India. And so the Portuguese are funding expeditions, the Spanish are funding expeditions. It was a real kind of arms race, what we would call an arms race today, to figure out where these new lands were. Magellan, of course, went around the world and was the first person to completely circumnavigate the world. Although he didn't actually make it, his ships made it, he died in the Philippines. 
Now, England wasn't completely left out of all of this. Just four years after Columbus set sail, Henry VII sent John Cabot to explore Newfoundland. John Cabot was an Italian navigator and explorer, and his 1497 voyage to the coast of North America under the commission of Henry VII, like I said, is the earliest known European exploration of coastal North America since the Norse visits to Vinland in the 11th century. Now, Cabot was actually a citizen of Venice, so he would have been eligible to engage in maritime trade, including trade to the Mediterranean that was the source of so much of Venice's wealth. He appeared to have gotten into some kind of financial trouble in the late 1480s, and he moved to Valencia in Spain, where his creditors attempted to have him arrested. In 1494, he moved on to Sevilla, where he proposed and was contracted to build and worked on the construction of a stone bridge over the Guadalquivir River. This project was abandoned then following a decision of the city council on the 24th of December, 1494. After this, he seems to have tried to seek support in Sevilla and Lisbon for an Atlantic expedition. Neither one gave him support, and so then he went up to London to seek funding and support. And he reached England around mid-1495. Now, Cabot was really interested in leaving from England because at that northern latitude, the longitudes are much closer to each other, so it's a shorter voyage across the ocean. And he was still hoping that he would find an alternative route to China through that northern route. Cabot went to Bristol to start with, which had a history of funding exploratory expeditions into the Atlantic. And he received a royal patent in 1496 stating that all expeditions should be undertaken from Bristol. So his financial supporters were probably based in Bristol. It also said that any of the commerce resulting from any discoveries must be conducted with England alone and with goods only being brought through Bristol. So they really wanted to have Bristol be this monopoly port with the only rights to engage in any kind of colonial trade. And this wasn't unusual. Portugal had done the same thing with Lisbon, and Spain was doing the same with Sevilla. The letters patent from Henry VII give Cabot free authority, faculty, and power to sail to all parts, regions, and coasts of the eastern, western, and northern sea under our banners, flags, and ensigns with five ships or vessels of whatsoever burden and quality they may be, and with so many and with such mariners and men as they may wish to take with them in the said ships at their own proper costs and charges to find, discover, and investigate whatever islands, countries, regions, or provinces of heathens and infidels in whatever part of the world placed, which before this time were unknown to Christians. There's not a whole lot known about Cabot's first voyage. There's something called the John Day Letter, written by John Day, who was a Bristol merchant originally out of London. And he sent this letter in the winter of 1497 to 98, sent to somebody believed to actually be Christopher Columbus. And the letter refers briefly to the voyage, but writes mostly about the second 1497 expedition. Day said, since your lordship wants information relating to the first voyage, here is what happened. He went with one ship, his crew confused him, he was short of supplies and ran into bad weather, and he decided to turn back. Cabot received his first royal patent in March of 1496, so it's believed that he made his first voyage that summer. Then we have the 1497 voyage. Mostly the information from that comes from letters and an entry in a 1565 chronicle in Bristol. It says in full, this year on St. John the Baptist Day, 24th of June, 1497, the land of America was found by the merchants of Bristol in a ship of Bristol called the Matthew. The which said ship departed from the port of Bristol the 2nd day of May and came home again the 6th of August next following. Now that John Day letter that was written in 1497-98 in that winter, it gives a lot of information about Cabot's second voyage. John Day appears to have been familiar with all of the figures of the expedition and was able to report on it in great detail. And historians think it was Columbus that he was writing to because Columbus would have had a great interest in whatever lands were being discovered based on the Treaty of Tordesillas, if they were Spanish lands, if he had a right to those lands, and if it was challenging his monopoly or not. Now, there is another letter, supposedly, that has yet to be found, but historians believe exists because of mentions of it. And this letter apparently has new evidence supporting the claim that the seamen of Bristol had already discovered the land across the ocean before Cabot's arrival in England. 
Historians contend that the Bristol seamen had reached North America two decades before Cabot's expedition, but until we get conclusive evidence of that, it's still John Cabot. And then the Great Chronicle of London tells us the story of the third trip in 1498, where Cabot left with a fleet of five ships from Bristol in May of 1498. Some of the ships were carrying merchandise, cloth, caps, lace, and other trifles, and this suggests that Cabot intended to engage in trade. The Spanish envoy in London reported in July that one of the ships had been caught in a storm and had to land in Ireland, but that Cabot and the other four ships continued on. For centuries, no other records were found that relate to this expedition, and it was long believed that Cabot and his fleet were lost at sea. But at least one of the men scheduled to accompany the expedition, Lancelot Thurkle, is recorded as living in London in 1501. So it's not known whether Cabot died during this voyage or returned safely and died shortly after. The historian Alwyn Ruddock has worked on Cabot and this era for over 35 years, and she suggested that Cabot and his expedition returned to England in the spring of 1500. She claims that their return followed an epic two-year exploration of the east coast of North America, south into the Chesapeake Bay area, and perhaps as far as the Spanish territories in the Caribbean. Her evidence includes the well-known world map of the Spanish cartographer Juan de la Cosa. His chart includes the North American coast and seas, quote, discovered by the English between 1497 and 1500. The Cabot Project at the University of Bristol was organized in 2009 to search for this evidence on which all of these claims rest, as well as to undertake related studies of Cabot and his expeditions. King Henry VII continued to support exploration out of the Port of Bristol. He granted Hugh Elliot, Robert Thorne, and his son a bounty of 20 pounds in January of 1502 for purchasing the Gabriel, a ship for an expedition voyage that summer. Later, he also paid Elliot a reward of 100 pounds for a voyage or voyages in two ships to the Isle of the New Founding, as Newfoundland was called. This amount was larger than any previously accounted for in royal support of the explorations. And right around this time, the Bristol Explorers established a formal company backed by letters patent called the Company Adventures to the New Found Land. And this company conducted further expeditions in 1503 and 1504. In 1508 and 1509, Sebastian Cabot undertook a final voyage to North America from Bristol. He apparently explored a section of the coast from the Hudson Bay to about the Chesapeake Bay. Then he returned to England in 1509 he found that his sponsor, Henry VII, had died and that there was a new king, Henry VIII, who was more interested in war with France and the glory of the Hundred Years' War than in westward expansion to America. And that, my friend, takes us to the end of the first unit. Next time, we're going to focus more on England and discuss the journeys that begin to take place in the mid-16th century with the Muscovy Company and the trip to find the Northeast Passage And then we're going to lead up to the golden age of exploration in England. And then in the third and final lesson, like I said, we'll talk about England's own navigation around the globe and exploration after Elizabeth died. So I hope you've enjoyed this first unit and the next one will drop in a few more days. Let me know what kind of questions you have. Let me know what your feedback is if you have any. And thank you so much again for being part of this community.